Good morning or afternoon, everyone. Welcome to session 2B of the CARS 20, PRI 2021 conference. Uh, this session is uh, entitled Safe System Approach Vision Zero Road Safety Management. All topics that I'm very passionate about. Uh, my name is Raheem Dilgir with TransSafe Consulting and the CARS board. Coming to you from sunny Vancouver, land of the Squeam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. I'm your moderator for the session. I just have a few housekeeping items to quickly mention before we get started. The conference interpretation service is available by clicking on the planet sphere icon at the bottom of your screen. That's the bottom of the zoom uh, window uh, towards the right uh, side, uh, not on the feed loop uh, site. Um, and just to the left of the interpretation icon is the Q&A tab. So if you do have any questions during any of the um, uh, presentations, please do type them in to that tab and then we will um, go through as many as we can uh, in the little time uh, that we do have. Um, as well, if there's certain questions that you see that you particularly like, feel free to like them uh, and then they will rise to the, the, to the top of the list um, uh, to ask uh, presenters. Um, just uh, an, another thing uh, about the conference in general, we, 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 if you hear something exciting or you're enjoying your cell conference, you want to share something, please do uh, post to social media and use the hashtag uh, CARSPRI2021. And uh, all posts with that, sh that hashtag will appear on the social wall in the uh, lobby. Um, so yeah, hopefully there will be a little bit of time after each session. There's 15, five 15-minute 15 presentations, so it's, it is a full, um, uh, a full session. Um, just to make sure we do get through all of them, um, and at the cost of being rude, I am going to uh, speak up verbally um, towards the end of uh, about 10 or 11 minutes into each presentation. So presenters, I apologize in advance uh, that I will be interrupting uh, just to ask you then uh, to wrap it up in a, in a couple of minutes. Hopefully there'll be a little bit of time for questions then. Uh, well, that's about it. So um, with that, I'd like to uh, introduce the first speaker and I do ask the speakers to then uh, each speaker to turn their uh, video on and their microphone on. So first we have uh, Paul Bowes, who will speak about comparison of road safety management in six countries. Over to you, Paul. Thank you, Raheem. Uh, is the screen up? Can everyone see the screen? Yes. All yours, Paul. Thank you. So uh, we're going to talk about comparison of road safety management in selected countries. Uh, I'd just like to acknowledge the co-author here, Brian Jonah, from Road Safety Canada Consulting. I know that time is very limited. We have six countries to go through, so I'm just going to hit the important points. But there are more details found in the slides if you want to read them later. And there's also a report that's referenced at the end, which has even more information. The six countries are Australia, Canada, Netherlands, Sweden, the United Kingdom, and the United States. So Australia has a federal government and seven state territorial governments. The federal government is responsible for safety standards, infrastructure support, impaired driving laws. The state governments and territorial governments are responsible for funding and operating road networks, driver licensing and vehicle registration, traffic acts covering behavior and policing. It's a similar uh, system, not that different from Canada. Um, the Office of Road Safety in the Department of Infrastructure is responsible for new and existing road safety programs, stakeholder support, and report on the national strategy. They use a safe systems approach to achieve Vision Zero by 20. 2050. The interim goal is a 30% reduction in fatalities and, uh, and serious injuries by 2020. And partners include governments and universities, um, most specifically Monash University. 
They use the safe systems approach, which basically has three key principles. People are not perfect. They make mistakes. Um, there are physical limits to what humans can survive. And the system must be forgiving in terms of considering safety and those limits. Um, you can see this diagram, which was also presented by Etienne Krug uh, yesterday. They look at safe roads, safe speeds, safe vehicles, and safe users. And they consider education, innovation, enforcement, data, and coordination. Um, there's increased infrastructure funding on regional roads and intersections. They reduce speeds to 40 where pedestrians and cyclists are present. present. There are roadside impaired testing, uh, often random testing programs. They've worked on commercial vehicles, including licensing and fatigue and faster deployment of vehicle technologies. From 2010 to 2019, there was a 12% reduction in fatalities. The rate was down 24% per billion vehicle kilometers traveled. There were reductions related to single vehicle fatalities down 12%, impaired driving down 40%, heavy vehicle crashes down 17%. There's a new plan to 2030 to reduce fatalities by 50% and serious injuries by 30%. If you look at Canada, and we'll go through this one very quickly because I'm sure we're all very used to this, but the federal gov there's a federal government, 13 provinces, they work collectively through uh, the Canadian Council of Motor Transport Administrators, TAC, and other stakeholders. Road Safety Strategy 2025 was approved by all ministers in 2016. Each jurisdiction is encouraged to have their own plan based on their local needs. There is a database of proven and promising countermeasures that's available online, and they work with industry and other partners. There is a matrix as part of this, which is shown here, um, that looks at contributing factors and risk groups. From 2008 to 2019, the fatality rate per 100,000 drivers was down 29%. Serious injury rate was down 36%. The Netherlands road safety strategy involves central and local governments. Uh, there are different government departments at different levels, and the Safe Traffic Netherlands and the Institute for Safety Research, or SWAV as it's known. Road Safety Strategy 2008 to 2020 was based on sustainable safety vision. It sets targets every four years based on forecasts from data that they have. The current target is 500 fatalities and 10,600 in injuries by 2020. They have five principles, functionality about the use of the road, biomechanics, uh, respecting speed, direction, mass, size of, of the different road users, the psychologics, uh, the rules have to make sense and have to be understandable and usable by people. There are responsibilities that are allocated to different groups. And there's uh, learning and innovation where there's a guaranteed maximum road safety result for each road user. 2010 to 2017, fatalities down 4%, serious injuries down 37% to 2016, cyclists and elderly involved collisions had increased. Currently developing the 2020 to 2030 strategy, including regional and local governments. Sweden, the national government and several provincial governments. There's the Swedish Transport Administration, which is responsible for planning of the network and network road safety policy. The Ministry of Enterprise and Innovation responsible for road infrastructure, monitoring and road safety development. And the Swedish Transport Agency responsible for vehicle safety and road user education and public awareness. They were the first in 97 to use Vision Zero. It's similar to the Australian version. Um, the latest strategy is to reduce fatalities by 50% and serious injuries by 25% up to 2020, 2020 from 20, 2007. 
2010 to 2019, fatalities decreased by 22%. Fatality rate um, increased by 9%. Oh, I'm sorry, it increased by 22%. The rate increased by 9%. Injury collisions down 14%. Heavy vehicle crashes with light duty vehicles increased 68% from 2007 to 2018, 17 to 18. 2016 impaired driving has remained at 24%. Since 2010, only 45% uh, of drivers are in compliance with the speed limits. The Swedish Transport Administration produced an action plan for road safety 2019 to 2022, and they're considering renewing their target of 50% fatality reduction and 25% in serious injuries by 2030. The United Kingdom is a unitary state with county and local authorities. The Road Devolution and Monitoring Group from the Department of Transport is the lead agency. They develop strategy and policies, driver licensing and vehicle registration, freight operator licensing, pedestrian and bicycle safety, and infrastructure programs. Highway England is responsible for safety on strategic English highways. <clears throat> they ad uh, adopted the safe systems approach to achieve vision zero goals. The evaluation of the local road safety found national targets had stimulated local partnerships. Since 2010, they moved away from national targets, which lowered the local priority to road safety. A 2018 review found road safety management good at sharing information and supporting stakeholders. The weakness was identified as a lack of performance framework resulting in a lack of focus and coordination. From 2010 to 2019, fatalities were down 5%, but then plateaued, serious injuries down 23%, pedestrian fatalities up 17%. 2018, the government committed to invest uh, more, but endorsed local decision-making rather than national targets. And a framework by 2040 uh, were killed and injured on strategic road network would approach zero. The United States, there's the federal government and 50 state governments. You have to have the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, which does road safety and vehicle safety. FMCSA, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety uh, Agency, looks at, uh, deals with motor carriers, and the Federal Highway Administration takes care of infrastructure. The states are responsible for driver licensing, vehicle registration, building and maintaining highways, traffic act laws, including impaired driving, seatbelt speed, and distracted driving. They also do ongoing research and program development, which is obviously more advantageous for larger states like New York and California than smaller states. Hi, Paul, two minutes. Okay. Um, 2016 to 2020 safety protective, um, their strategy includes safety, protective vehicle safety, automated vehicles, human choices, and organizational excellence some adoption of Vision Zero at the national, state, and local governments. The DOT is part of the Road to Zero Coalition to reduce vehicle fatalities by 2050. Each state must develop a strategic highway safety plan to be eligible for federal funds. 2010 to 2019, fatalities were up 9%. The, the rate was unchanged. Injuries increased by 17%. The, in, the rate increased by 15%. There are 12, according to Lund in University, effective road safety management tools. Um, essentially, just quickly, you need to define your data, set your policy, you need to clearly define responsibility and to set targets. In addition, you need a plan, um, you need funding, that's accessible by the stakeholders. Again, there needs to be responsibility taken and very important, you need to monitor progress. All of this is part of a larger road safety management and selected countries report 
that's in the International Encyclopedia of Transportation. Um, the reference is there, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Paul. Wow, you covered six countries in, uh, in a pretty short time. So thank you for that. Um, a reminder to uh, those in the audience who have questions uh, for Paul, please type them into the Q&A uh, module at the, at the bottom of the screen. Uh, while you're doing that, Paul, perhaps I'll ask uh, one question. Um, those countries that are known to have a better safety performance uh, over in recent years, did you notice any kind of correlation between what types of things they included in their plan, in their strategic plan that were perhaps not part of other countries that didn't have as effective a safety performance? I think part of it is a centralized, um, a centralized plan in terms of road safety, where you get jurisdictions where it's a lot of diffused responsibility, then it, there gets to be an issue. And I also think there's an issue of fatigue. You, you're successful at it, and then people think we've done it, but you've never really done it. You got to stay on it. And um, I think if you've seen in some countries that did very well, then they wane, and then they have to bring the pressure back. Yeah, I don't see any other questions in the Q and A, so I'm just going to follow that up. It did catch my attention that Sweden had such a significant increase in fatalities. I think it was 22 percent between 20 and 2018, and we've kind of known and and uh, kind of followed them in terms of the way that they've approached uh, road safety over the years. Is there anything that I don't know if you've looked into that? If there's anything in particular you could attribute that to, is it what you were just describing? Something else? I think it's it's pretty much what we talked about. I mean, they went. Uh, very hard on, on safety and made some very significant inroads. So they've done very well. So there's an opportunity, I guess, for an increase in terms of the numbers. Also, I think people think, well, we've done it, we're finished. And they don't really understand yeah. in terms of road safety, you're never finished. There are always new drivers um, coming along and new challenges, distracted driving, automated vehicles coming along. So you got to stay on top of it. Yeah. Good reminder for, for all of us. Uh, th I don't see any other questions right now. So if you uh, if you do have questions that you think of later, please do type them in and try to get to them at the end. But uh, with that, I want to thank you, Paul. And I want to introduce our next speaker. So uh, Brian Jonah is uh, the next speaker, and he's going to speak about road safety in Canada during the United Nations Decade of Action. Brian, over to you to share your screen. Can you hear me? Can hear you. Uh, the video won't turn on. Oh, there it is. Start my video. Okay. All right. right. Okay, can you see the slide? Yep, yep great, me? thanks. So, yep, over to you, Brian. Okay, uh, hello everybody. I'd like to talk to you this afternoon about uh, road safety in Canada during the United Nations Decade of Action on Road Safety. And uh, Paul Mose is my uh, co-author on this. The United Nations General Assembly passed a resolution in March 2010 to establish a decade of action on road safety from 2011 to uh, 2020. It's being led by the World Health Organization and they want to stabilize and then reduce the number of fatalities and injuries over this period of time. That was the goal. The basic pillars for this decade of action were, um, were activities conducted at the national, regional and global levels. And they were uh, road safety management, safer road design, safer vehicles, safer road users, and uh, post-crash care. So the purpose of this presentation is to examine Canada's progress on road safety during the UN Decade of Action on Road Safety from 2011 to 2020. Now, in terms of the data analysis, what we were trying to do 
in this study was examine the changes in Canada and the numbers and rates of fatalities and serious injuries from the year 2008 to 2019 uh, using Transport Canada's National Collision Database data, coroner data for the uh, prevalence of alcohol and drug prevalence in, in fatally injured drivers, observational survey data for alcohol and drug use by, by drivers, as well as other surveys looking at distracted driving. I should point out that in some cases, we don't have data right up to 2019. It'll be a little bit earlier. So first, I want to show you here um, the number, I'll back up, the number of fatalities in Canada during the period of 2008 to 2019. You can see there's a downward trend over this period of time. And in fact, what we see is that the number of fatalities have gone down by 28% over this period of time. Looking at the number of serious injuries, these are people who are hospitalized as a result of a collision. Again, we can see that there's a decrease from 2008 to 2019. Um, and in fact, there was a reduction of 31% between those two years. <clears throat> we also looked at the fatalities per 100,000 licensed drivers by jurisdiction between 2008 and 2019. And on the right, right side there, you can see Canada as a whole, uh, and 2008 is the orange bar and 2019 is the blue bar. And for Canada as a whole, what we see was a 29% reduction in the rate between these years. And if you look at the jurisdictions, we see that uh, all but two jurisdictions showed reductions in the fatalities per 100,000 licenses, uh, licensed drivers. Uh, the only two that went up have relatively small numbers, which are relatively uh, uh, unstable. Turning to uh, serious injuries, again, it's the same kind of presentation. Canada as a whole is on the far right, and we see that there was a 36% reduction in the uh, serious injury rate for 100,000 drivers. Again, all jurisdictions with the except of two territories uh, showed a reduction between 2008 and 2018. How's Canada doing uh, internationally? This shows you here the fatalities per billion vehicle kilometers traveled for the year 2018, and it compares Canada with other countries uh, who are part of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And in the red there, you can see that Canada is in the 12th position, uh, tied actually with Austria, Austria and the Netherlands at 4.9 um, fatalities per billion vehicle kilometers traveled. Now, if we turn to look at specific uh, road safety issues, uh, we see here, first of all, the percentage of fatalities involving a driver uh, that was under the influence of alcohol. And this, uh, was considered to be a contributing factor uh, according to the investigating police officer. And it's uh, shown here from 2008 to 2019. And what we can see is that there was a decrease between those two years of about 17%. Next, if we look at fatally injured drivers who are tested by coroners for, to determine presence of alcohol, this data comes from the Traffic Injury Research Foundation. Uh, we can see that there's a downward trend over the period of 2008 to 2017, uh, 2017 being the most recent year available. And what we find is that there was a 22% reduction between 2008 and 2017 in the percentage of fatal injured drivers who tested positive. Next, if we turn to uh, looking at the presence of drugs, this is uh, showing us. Uh, data from the police investigation. And you see there's an upward trend here over the uh, uh, year, years 2008 to 2019. Um, and in fact, there was a 30% increase in drugs as a contributing factor in collisions that resulted in fatalities during that period of time. Again, if we look at the coroner data for uh, fatally injured drivers, 
and uh, looks at the testing, those testing positive for psychodynamic drugs from 2008 to 2017. Again, coming from turf, you can see there's an upward trend here over those years. And in fact, what we're seeing is uh, a 5% increase in uh, the percentage of drivers who uh, tested positive for psychodynamic drugs. If we look specifically at cannabis uh, and uh, fatally injured drivers, uh, again, the data is from turf. You can see here that it goes up over the uh, years 2008 to 2017. Actually, it's an increase of uh, 11% over those years. Now, there have been a number of roadside surveys that have been conducted in Canada over the years. And I'm just going to share a couple of provinces. First of all, British Columbia uh, has done nighttime roadside surveys in 2012 and 2018. Uh, looking at the first set of columns here, uh, drinking of alcohol, um, it was higher in 2012 than it was in 2018. And in fact, it decreased by 25% uh, in those years. Uh, if you look at drugs, however, the uh, use of drugs was found to be higher in the 2018 survey than in the 2012 survey by 16%. Ontario did a similar survey in 2014 and 2017. Actually, in, for alcohol, they found no difference between the 2014 and the 2017 surveys, that 4%. However, the number of drivers or the percentage of drivers using drugs uh, went up considerably, about 40%. Uh, in the 2017 survey compared to the 2014 survey. Now, if we look at other road safety issues, this shows you the percentage of drivers who were considered to be distracted or inattentive in uh, collisions that resulted in fatalities. And what we have here is about a 5% increase over that period of time, and there was an upward trend. There have been observational surveys of the use of mobile phones by drivers in Canada several times, actually. Uh, first on the far left in 2009-10, then in 2012-13, and then uh, most recently 2016 and 17. Uh, first of all, looking at, looking at talking on the phone, we can see that uh, in the orange bars here, actually it goes down from the first to the second survey, but actually it goes back up uh, by 26% in the most recent survey. We looked at texting as well. We didn't do it in the first survey, but uh, you can see that in the 2013 survey, uh, it was about 1.6% uh, and it went up uh, 38% uh, in the 2017 survey. <clears throat> Speeding in fatal collisions, we can see here there's an upward trend over this period of time, 2008 to 2019. And actually, from 2008 to 2019, there was a 17% increase uh, in the percentage of uh, fatal collisions that resulted in uh, uh, fatality, according to police. Now, if we look at young drivers, here we show the uh, drivers involved in fatal collisions per 100,000 licensed drivers by age group from 2008 to 2019. The orange is 2008, the blue is 2019. First thing on the far, the first thing you notice on this is that all age groups showed a reduction over this period of time. However, more interestingly, uh, the increase or the decrease rather was greatest for those 15 to 19, where it went down 70%, and those um, 20 to 24, where the reduction was 55%. Go on now to pedestrian, the number of pedestrian fatalities over this period of time. There was a slight increase of about 1% over the period of 2008 to 2019. Motorcyclist fatalities, again, there was an increase over the, uh, the time 2008 to 2019. Um, actually, 2019 was 47% higher than 2008. But that's mainly due to the 2019 number that went up quite a bit compared to earlier years. Two minutes, oh, France. Yeah. Uh, bicyclists, we can see that there's a downward trend here. Uh, it's actually up and down. But when you compare uh, 2019 to 2008, 
it's down about uh, uh, 43 percent uh, for bicyclists. Finally, if we look at uh, fatalities involving heavy commercial vehicles, we can see again there's a downward trend here. Uh, actually, in 2019, uh, was down 28 percent. So what do we conclude, conclude about all this? Overall, the level of road safety in Canada has improved over the period of uh, the UN Decade of Action on Road Safety, uh, both in terms of numbers and rates of fatalities and serious injuries. We see improvements in safety regarding alcohol impaired driving, young drivers, and commercial vehicles, but there are declines in drugs and driving, particularly cannabis, distracted driving, speeding, and both motorcycle and bicycle safety. I should point out, as uh, uh, ATN Krug mentioned yesterday, there's a new decade of action being launched this October, and the target will be 50% reduction in fatalities and injuries by 2030. So I guess if we have time, uh, we can uh, take any questions there might be. Yeah, there are a couple of minutes. Uh, thank you, Brian, for that very uh, compelling presentation. A lot of interesting trends uh, uh, that you shared. So uh, everybody, please, if you do have a question for Brian, type it into the Q&A module at the bottom of the Zoom window. I don't see anything in there yet. Um, so perhaps in the meantime, Brian, I'll just uh, ask you, um, if you just go to your uh, the conclusion slide. Yeah. The the you'd meant you know you'd listed there there is declines in some in those areas. Would you like to address one or more of those areas in terms of how uh, can might uh, make you know reverse that that trend in 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 any of those areas or how we're already looking to do so? Well, I'll I'll mention one. Uh, speeding speeding is still going up. Um, there is an opportunity for governments to address this issue with automated speed control. Uh, now, some jurisdictions, some provinces are doing this. Some cities are doing it. Uh, even in Ottawa, they're doing it as a pilot around schools. But this is proven technology. It works. So if governments were to uh, allow this in all jurisdictions in their, in their province or territory, then uh, I think we could have an impact on speed. Uh, drugs and driving, well, as pointed out by other speakers today, uh, the use of cannabis uh, and driving is going up. It's uh, the, Obviously, the use of uh, cannabis is, is legal now, but it clearly is not legal while you're driving a vehicle. And there are laws to deal with that. And I think what we need is uh, more enforcement on the road to detect drivers who are under the influence of cannabis. So I'll, I'll leave it there unless there's any particular issues you want to pursue. Sure, thanks, Brian. Uh, another question has, uh, has come. Um, do the figures for mobile phone use include hands-free calling? Uh, no, that's a good point. Uh, we only wanted to include people who were actually holding the device while they were operating the vehicle. Okay. Great. I don't see any other questions in the uh, in the module. Maybe I'll just take another quick one. Well, it might not be quick, but I'll, I'll ask it quickly. <laughs> uh, Brian, do you know Canada's plans for um, for 2030 for either reflecting or trying to be consistent with the the decade of action? Uh, I don't. 2030. Um, I know that we're in the middle of the current road safety strategy 2025. Um, it does have a vision of reaching zero, uh, but it doesn't set any targets. Um, there may well be discussion going on now um, through the Canadian Council of Motor Transport Administrators that, that includes all jurisdictions about what they might do uh, during the UN Decade of Action for uh, 2021 uh, 20, uh, to 2030. Um, I'm not aware of any plans? Great. Okay, thank you so much, Brian, for your presentation and answering the question. You could stop sharing, and I'll ask the next uh, speaker, Catherine, to share her screen. So, uh, Catherine Fourel de Fret will speak about the evaluation of urban road safety policies. 
Um, this will be delivered in French, so if you need interpretation, please um, select that option. Uh, Ken, over to you. Merci, bonjour à tous. Euh, donc effectivement, euh, je vais vous présenter euh, le projet PUSER. C'est un projet d'évaluation des politiques urbaines de sécurité routière en France. Donc la présentation que je vais vous faire aujourd'hui euh, s'articulera sur les euh, différents ingrédients euh, qui ont été nécessaires pour conduire cette démarche évaluative. Avant de, de commencer, de rentrer dans le sujet, quelques mots sur euh, le projet. Donc c'est un projet qui est conventionné avec la délégation à la sécurité routière. Il est porté par le CEREMA, Territoire et Ville et l'Université Gustave Eiffel que je représente aujourd'hui. Alors dans quel contexte s'inscrit cette démarche euh, Eh bien d'abord, elle concerne l'accidentalité en milieu urbain. Donc qu'est-ce qu'on entend par milieu urbain En fait, il s'agit des voiries qui sont situées en agglomération au sens du code de la route c'est-à-dire les voiries qui sont situées entre les panneaux d'entrée et de sortie des communes. Ce milieu, il concerne deux tiers des accidents corporels, 30% des personnes tuées, et euh, dans ce milieu, deux tiers des personnes tuées sont des usagers vulnérables, c'est-à-dire des piétons, des cyclistes ou des usagers des deux roues motorisées. Ce milieu, il s'est apaisé au cours du temps, grâce à une série d'interventions importantes, D'abord, la limitation à 50 km h en ville, en 1990. Puis en 2008, les premiers effets du code de la rue se sont fait ressentir dans le code de la route. C'est-à-dire qu'en fait, nous avons euh, les zones de rencontre qui sont rentrées dans le code de la route et une redéfinition des zones 30 et des aires piétonnes. Aujourd'hui, le constat qui est fait, c'est que nous avons une absence euh, d'évaluation globale des politiques urbaines de sécurité routière même si parfois nous avons euh, des évaluations d'une mesure spécifique, comme c'est le cas à Grenoble avec l'évaluation du 30 km h Donc le constat, c'est qu'en fait, nous avons besoin d'une évaluation de ces politiques sur le long terme. Donc c'est là que prend tout son sens euh, le projet PUSER, puisqu'il cherche à mettre en regard sur 30 ans les politiques urbaines de mobilité et de sécurité routière et l'évolution de l'accidentalité en milieu urbain. L'objectif, c'est d'essayer de, euh, de, de, de mettre en évidence euh, qu'il y aurait des politiques potentiellement plus efficaces que d'autres pour réduire l'accidentalité en milieu urbain. Alors, D'abord, pour commencer cette, euh, cette démarche, il convient de questionner euh, l'objet à évaluer. Cela suppose euh, de s'interroger sur le périmètre d'étude. Notre étude elle est partie d'abord de l'échelle des plans de mobilité, donc, ce sont les territoires d'application euh, des documents de planification de la mobilité, ce qu'on appelle euh, en France les ressorts territoriaux. Mais cette échelle n'a pas été retenue parce qu'elle était trop vaste et mouvante euh, dans le temps. Donc, on a recentré notre étude sur le cœur de ces ressorts territoriaux qui correspond à ce qu'on appelle des villes sans, des territoires qui sont constants dans le temps. Donc, on a retenu 70 villes centres de plus de 50 000 habitants et leur première couronne. Pour évaluer la performance de ces territoires, euh, des questions se sont posées également sur les indicateurs de mesure. Qu'est-ce qu'il est possible de mesurer et surtout avec quelle fiabilité On a testé trois indicateurs de mesure et parmi eux, nous en avons retenu qu'un seul. Il s'agit du nombre d'accidents par habitant. Nous l'avons retenu eh bien parce qu'il présente une forte puissance statistique et aussi parce qu'il permet... Euh, de réaliser une meilleure comparabilité entre les villes. En fait, il est possible euh, de calculer, euh, de réaliser pardon, un test de fiabilité calculé à partir du taux de gravité. Et en fait, ce taux de gravité va nous permettre d'identifier s'il y a des sous-recensements des accidents. Notamment, ce test nous a permis d'orienter euh, les pistes de notre évaluation. Une piste d'abord sur l'évaluation des premières couronnes n'a pas pu être retenu parce que justement ce test montrait que nos données n'étaient pas fiables. Ce que, vous, ce que vous pouvez voir ici sur ce graphique, c'est que le taux de gravité de la gendarmerie nationale en bleu est anormalement élevé pour les accidents qu'il recense par rapport 
à celui des forces de police en orange, qu'on appelle aussi sécurité publique. En fait, ce biais, nous avons euh, pu le confirmer par la modélisation. Notamment, on a pu voir que euh, le taux de gravité de la gendarmerie est de l'ordre de 2,5 à 3 fois supérieur à celui de la sécurité publique, et pour quelles que soient les communes de notre échantillon. Donc, compte tenu de ce biais par rapport à la gendarmerie nationale et le fait que ce type de force de l'ordre est très présent dans ces communes de première couronne, nous n'avons pas retenu ce type d'évaluation. En revanche, une autre évaluation que nous avons pu conduire, c'est l'évaluation des villes-centres par rapport à la moyenne. Là, nos données sont bien adaptées parce que ces villes-centres sont principalement couvertes par les forces, de, les forces de police, la sécurité publique. On a toutefois quand même regardé s'il n'y avait pas des biais de sous-recensement, mais cette fois-ci liés aux villes. Et nous avons retiré six villes qui présentaient des taux de gravité aberrants. Donc, nous les avons retirés de l'échantillon. Une deuxième étape de cette démarche évaluative est la nécessité de croiser les outils et les approches pour appréhender une même réalité, donc notre objet à évaluer. Concernant les outils, l'outil principal que nous avons mobilisé, c'est la modélisation. On a, on a euh, mobilisé la modélisation parce que nous avions besoin euh, d'estimer les tendances de chacune des villes-centres par rapport à la moyenne. Pour pouvoir réaliser cela, nous avons eu recours à la régression de poissons. C'est un type de régression qui était bien adapté à nos données, qui sont de type comptage. Donc, nous avons utilisé ce type de régression. Et cette, euh, cette méthode, nous avons pu la comparer à d'autres méthodes d'analyse statistique qui nous ont permis de consolider nos résultats. Ensuite, concernant les approches, il nous a paru important de pouvoir croiser les approches et notamment de retenir deux approches complémentaires. Une première approche qui, elle, va évaluer la progression relative des villes-centres par rapport à la moyenne des autres villes. Et une deuxième qui, elle, va regarder plutôt la position relative des villes-centres par rapport à la moyenne en 2017, donc la dernière année de notre étude. Dans ces deux approches, on va, on va retenir comme valeur de référence la première année de notre étude, 1987, qui nous indiquera la position de chaque ville par rapport à la moyenne. Qu'est-ce que ça donne en termes de résultats Pour la première approche, qu'on peut voir ici sur ce classement, nous avons en vert et en orange les villes qui progressent plus vite que la moyenne et à l'inverse, les villes en bleu et en rouge qui progressent moins vite. Donc ça, ce sont des résultats qu'on peut lire à partir de l'axe des ordonnées. Si on tient compte également de la position initiale des villes, donc de la valeur de référence en 1987, on peut faire ressortir le groupe, ici en vert, de villes euh, le plus performant, c'est-à-dire les villes qui non seulement ont un nombre d'accidents par habitant meilleur en 1987, mais aussi qui diminuent plus vite. Dans l'approche 2, cette fois-ci, on va croiser euh, la position de chaque ville en 1987 avec leur position en 2017. Et là, de la même façon, on va avoir ici en vert les villes qui euh, sont les plus performantes, c'est-à-dire les villes qui ont un nombre d'accidents qui a un nombre d'accidents par habitant meilleur que les autres villes en 1987 et qui les restait en 2017. Maintenant, la dernière étape de cette évaluation, c'est la construction d'un modèle structurel pour parvenir à répondre à notre question de recherche. La question, c'est quels sont les déterminants de qui vont nous permettre d'évaluer euh, l'accidentalité routière en milieu urbain. Ces déterminants, en fait, euh, ça va être différents paramètres. Le premier, ça va être en premier lieu la, les politiques de mobilité et de sécurité routière. Ces politiques-là, ce sont telles qu'on veut évaluer, voir quels sont leurs effets sur l'accidentalité urbaine. Mais il y a évidemment d'autres paramètres qui concernent plutôt les caractéristiques propres aux villes qu'il faut tenir compte, notamment la morphologie urbaine, leur socio-économie, leur sociodémographie et leur mobilité. Ces différents paramètres vont se décliner en indicateurs. Donc, pour chaque indicateur, on va vouloir essayer de mesurer leurs effets. Quels effets ils peuvent avoir sur l'évolution de l'accidentalité urbaine On va en particulier regarder les politiques locales de mobilité et de sécurité routière 
où là, on va euh, développer euh, toute une série d'indicateurs, notamment des indicateurs qu'on va construire à partir des mesures dans les plans de mobilité. Par exemple, euh, une mesure en faveur de la sécurité pour les piétons, pour les deux roues motorisées ou encore pour les jeunes. Ça peut être également des mesures pour réduire euh, le nombre de zones dangereuses. Euh, donc voilà, quelques exemples de mesures que nous, allons, euh, que nous sommes en train de tester euh, dans notre modèle. Mais on tiendra compte bien évidemment de d'autres paramètres, de d'autres indicateurs qui eux aussi peuvent interagir avec cette accidentalité. Pour conclure, euh, oui. Merci. Pour conclure euh, à ce stade du projet, ce qui nous a paru important de faire ressortir, c'est que l'évaluation des politiques urbaines n'est pas une masse à faire. En effet, ce qu'on a, qu a pu voir, c'est que notre, nos données euh, peuvent être impactées par un sous-recensement des accidents, qui peut être lié structurellement au type de force de l'ordre, mais aussi plus ponctuellement aux pratiques locales. Ce qu'on a pu mettre en évidence, c'est qu'il existe bien des différences de performance entre les villes-centres. En tout cas, euh, à partir de l'indicateur que nous avons testé, qui est le nombre d'accidents par habitant. Nous avons aussi pu mettre euh, en évidence une typologie relative à la performance des villes. Et enfin, maintenant, et c'est le travail qui est en cours, c'est parvenir, essayer d'expliquer ces performances à partir des mesures des politiques publiques, mais aussi des autres variables qui concernent plus spécifiquement les villes, donc des variables économiques, démographiques, de morphologie et de mobilité. Voilà, je vous remercie et je laisse place aux questions. Thank you, Catherine, for a very interesting presentation. Um, uh, attendees, if you do have a question, please type it into the um, Q&A module at the bottom of the, uh, of the Zoom window. Um, there may be time for, uh, for one question, but perhaps in the meantime, I'll ask Catherine, I, I wasn't able to catch if you touched on this, but how did, the, did, did your data include any time over the past two years during the pandemic? And if so, then how did you account for the differences during that time? Alors, merci pour euh, cette question. Euh, malheureusement, non, nous n'avons pas tenu compte euh, de ce changement de, de contexte euh, lié à la pandémie. Euh, notre étude euh, a démarré il y a plus de deux ans. Euh, donc, en fait, ça s'arrête en 2017. Donc, évidemment, euh, nous n'étions pas encore euh, dans cette situation euh, qu'on connaît aujourd'hui. That's totally understandable. I think you did a, a fantastic job with the information that you did have. Um, okay, I see a question has come in. Um, Catherine, can you speak more about the impact of bias with regards to the efficacy of policy in different cities? Alors, je n'ai pas très bien compris quel type d'impact euh, il s'agissait. Est-ce que vous pouvez préciser euh, la question So, unfortunately, I don't speak French, um, but uh, I, I assume that… Uh, <laughs> je vais écouter en anglais. Alors. <laughs> je parle un, un, un peu, mais pas, pas beaucoup. OK. Um, yeah, I, I'm assuming that it… it It, uh, it just refers to, you know, what, what might have uh, been a bias in your information and how do you deal with that? I think you talked about the statistical ways of substituting for that, I think, but if you wanted to elaborate or add anything to that. I'm sorry, I don't understand. Uh, what do you mean? <laughs> Yeah, um, if, if the, the questioner would like to uh, provide a, a, a clarification of what's meant by bias, what type of bias are you referring to, um, then uh, Catherine can provide a more specific uh, response. 
But perhaps uh, if it's okay, Catherine, we will leave that for uh, the end uh, and uh, feel free to clarify that to the questioner. Uh, uh, take your time and do that. Yes. Uh, but for now, we'll move on to the uh, thank you. And thank you, Catherine, for your presentation. <laughs> um, so we'll move on to the next one. So um, if you, the next presenter could up uh, your screen. Uh, the next uh, presenter is Valerie Smith, uh, and she'll be speaking uh, about Shoot Vision Zero. The Canadian landscape. So over to you, uh, Valerie. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Can you see me, Raheem? Yes. Okay. And can you see my slideshow? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you, Raheem. Um, whoops. There we go. Um, so my name is Val Smith, and I'm the director of programs at Parachute. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Parachute's a national charity focused on uh, injury prevention. Uh, we believe, it, believe in a Canada free of serious injuries with Canadians living long lives to the fullest. Um, the agenda for today, I basically will be speaking a little bit about Parachute's approach to road safety, um, and I'll be focusing more on an overview of the process and key findings that came out of our uh, Parachute Vision Zero Canadian landscape. Um, before I begin, I just wanna thank KARSP and I also wanna thank our longtime sponsors and partners at Desjardins. So um, I'm sure everyone's seen a lot of these numbers already, um, but as we know, motor vehicle collisions are one of the top three leading causes of unintentional injury deaths in Canada. Um, we know that the majority of these deaths are preventable and predictable. Um, in 2018, transport incident injuries led to approximately 1,922 Canadians being killed on our roads, um, 379 pedestrians and cyclists killed. So a you know, good chunk of vulnerable road users. Um, out of Parachute's recent cost of injury report, um, we've also found that over $3.6 billion uh, is being um, uh, paid towards cost of transport incident injuries. So a huge amount of Canadian um, dollars are going to predictable and preventable uh, catastrophic injuries and uh, um, care following. Uh, so Parachute's Vision Zero uh, road safety approach. Um, so to guide our work in Vision Zero, uh, Anyone who's worked with Parachute knows that we pride ourselves on working with evidence and data. Uh, we don't do anything alone. We work through a very expansive um, partner network. We have um, a lot of formal partnerships with uh, national, provincial, and municipal organizations and government. Uh, we focus on a multifaceted approach, so education, engineering, enforcement, evaluation, um, and we're really starting to take a stronger lens on equity within road safety. Uh, we use principles of knowledge translation and the theory of change um, drives most of our knowledge translation and research work. Uh, so I don't need to explain to Vision, what Vision Zero is to this group, but I do like this quote by Jerry Shimko from Edmonton, uh, which really speaks uh, quite loudly to the Vision Zero framework. So why wait for crashes if you can mitigate the conflicts right off the top? Um, so as everyone, uh, as I assume everyone knows, Vision Zero is about uh, being proactive um, and really trying to create systemic change before we see these catastrophic injuries and deaths on our road. Parachute focuses on a few fo uh, key areas around Vision Zero. So speed limits and speed reduction, uh, increasing the use of seat belts, improving road infrastructure and the built environment, uh, impaired and distracted driving, uh, safer car design, um, and enhancing pedestrian and cyclist safety. And within that bucket, we've really started to um, accelerate some of our work around active transport and multimodal transport. So how do we raise the profile of Vision Zero in Canada? Um, we work, as I said, very closely with our Vision Zero network. Um, so we have over 650 members, which are mainly made up of organizations, uh, government, and uh, individual champions and advocates. Uh, we collaborate um, very much with municipalities from across the country. 
Uh, we do a number of campaigns on an annual basis. Um, we do a lot of knowledge exchange events and we create products. Um, and finally, uh, we do um, uh, strategic communication. So we develop a lot of content around road safety and we uh, disseminate that digitally um, on the web, uh, through social media and other mass communication campaigns. Um, so just a little bit specifically about some of those pieces, as I said, uh, partnership and capacity building is very, um, very much important to the framework of the work we're doing. We collaborate with um, a number of municipalities. Generally, municipalities um, will contact Parachute and um, they, they have really um, kind of entry level questions around Vision Zero and how they go about um, adopting it in their municipality. So we tend to be an organization that really helps with that early startup piece. Uh, we also run a number of campaigns. National Teen Driver Safety Week is our annual uh, road safety campaign, but we also run a series of Vision Zero communication campaigns. Um, as many of you know and have been to, we run multiple Vision Zero conferences. Um, and over the last year and a half with COVID, we've uh, run a series of Vision Zero panels. Um, some of our knowledge project products that you can find on our website are a series of implementation tools that we provide to municipalities. Uh, the Vision Zero Canadian landscape, which I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and last year, we, um, uh, we authored the Canadian chapter on the International Vision Zero Handbook. Um, and as I said, we produce a lot of communications content. So that brings me to the Vision Zero Canadian landscape. Um, so in late 2019, um, Parachute profiled 24 jurisdictions that, were in it, that had already implemented Vision Zero or who were in the process of implementing Vision Zero. Um, and in the process, we conducted 14 interviews with uh, policymakers and road safety advocates within those cities. Um, and so why did we create this Canadian landscape? Um, what we found is there was a real lack of reporting on the overall Canadian landscape of Vision Zero. Um, we felt there was a need for one document that provided a summary of cities and region provinces and territories um, that had adopted or were considering adopting Vision Zero. Um, we wanted to explore implementation experiences in Canada. So we often hear a lot about what's happening in Europe and United States, um, but we had a lot of um, uh, stakeholders who were looking for information specifically in Canada. Um, and uh, specifically, they were looking for uh, successes and challenges faced by other jurisdictions who had already implemented Vision Zero. Um, the landscape uh, sought to provide relevant real world, world experience and insights from the front lines. Uh, the interviews um, discussed the successes and challenges when implementing Vision Zero. Um, and provide advice for jurisdictions contemplating formal adoption of Vision Zero. Uh, so how did we go about doing this? We did a very big scan of what was happening in Canada. We did a lot of um, outreach to cities across the country uh, to find out what they were doing around a safe systems and Vision Zero approach, if anything. Um, from there, we uh, conducted 14 um, interviews with jurisdictions um, who were in some stage of um, doing Vision Zero. Um, and then we developed a summary of Vision Zero in Canada focused on four, uh, 24 jurisdictions. So again, uh, early stages of adopting Vision Zero, mid-stage and formally adopted within council. Uh, and from there, we disseminated it to all, disseminated it to all our stakeholders um, and we've been sharing information at uh, conferences and events. Uh, the Vision Zero map um, is on the parachute.ca website. It's very helpful in terms of geographically um, visualizing the um, different jurisdictions that have um, implemented Vision Zero. And if you click on each of the little checks, you can see what stage the cities are at. And it also um, connects directly to their traffic road safety plans and any, um, any data that they've produced through evaluations. Um, okay, so quickly going through some of the patterns um, of, and key findings around challenges. So um, I'm sure it's no surprise that funding has been an ongoing challenge with almost every city we spoke to. 
um, a real lack of specific funding dedicated to Vision Zero, a different perspective. So you have a lot of different players in Vision Zero um, that you need to bring to the table. So engineering, enforcement, public health, um, and a lot of these um, a lot of these stakeholders have very different ways of doing their own work. Um, so really challenging to bring these groups together um, and competing priorities from council and within stakeholder groups. Two minutes, Valerie. Okay, um, so I'll quickly go through um, these uh, challenges. So a big challenge around rural areas. So from Sean, we have, uh, he's out in Grand Prairie. Um, and he basically just speaks to the idea that if you're in a small municipality, reach out to cities um, or towns around you and try to do something collectively. Um, committing to concepts of Vision Zero and the importance of long-term commitment. So here, Beth from Brantford talks about uh, really needing to encourage public buy-in and a public feedback process in order to um, get public buy-in for Vision Zero. Um, here, uh, David from City of Hamilton talks about people just being um, challenged by change and um, really thinking about the roads and uh, traffic operations first mentality rather than livable and um, uh, vibrant streets for vulnerable road users. Um, access to data. I think we've heard lots about this. So just the challenges cities have doing evaluations and getting data, um, especially around hotspots. So solutions. Um, so uh, a number of cities came back saying it was extremely important to develop a, a leadership committee with a clear understanding to help bring everyone to the table and reach consensus amongst your stakeholders. Um, collaboration and ongoing engagement with all partners. So again, this quote from Colleen in BC just speaks to in the, the importance of working with all the folks in all the different areas of traffic and, and uh, road design. Persistence and patience. So be committed, vigilant, ready for a worthwhile challenge. That came out of Southwest London or Southwest Ontario. Identify and alive vision zero with other strategic priorities. So transport, climate change, chronic disease prevention, try to find intersection points and leverage resources. Um, engage constituents and key stakeholders to raise awareness and build support for Vision Zero. It won't work unless you've got public buy-in. Uh, and identify quick wins and short-term goals. Uh, build momentum as well as a longer-term plan. So we have a 70-something page document that uh, speaks to the 24 jurisdictions. Um, and I encourage you to reach out to me or go right to our website if you want to take a deeper dive into that. So zero deaths on our road, um, we can do this. And uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Valerie, for sharing all the great tools that uh, Parachute has uh, developed over the years. Um, I'm just gonna read one of the questions that's come up in the Q&A module. Okay. And the question is, uh, Parachute work in both languages. Uh, any activities in Quebec uh, other than Montreal? Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, we do work in both languages. Uh, we do have uh, a number of staff on board who are fully bilingual. Um, we have a number of partners in Quebec. So we really, um, in full transparency, we rely very heavily on our, our partners in Quebec and our bilingual and francophone partners there. Uh, we, there, is, there is some activity happening in Trois Rivières, uh, in Sherbrooke, uh, in Montreal, uh, Quebec City, um, and again, we, we try to stay on top of what's happening there through our partners and our uh, champions. Great, and I'm sure if the questioner has uh, wants more information, can reach out to you directly. Yeah, absolutely. Great, thank you. Um, so I don't see anything else that's come up. Uh, so in the interest of time, we're gonna move to the final presentation. So thank you very much, Val, for your wonderful presentation. No and um, we'll ask uh, the last uh, presenter to start sharing uh, her screen. And the topic is uh, prioritization of theme and customers in road safety. And the presenter is Cynthia Take. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Cynthia, over to you. Euh, oui, bonjour, merci beaucoup. Euh, Est-ce que vous voyez bien où il y a le carré noir en haut? Là? Yes. 
Donc, I, I can see it clearly. OK, good. Euh, donc, aujourd'hui... Merci. Euh, donc, aujourd'hui, je viens vous présenter la priorisation des thématiques et des clientèles dans le cadre de la stratégie de prévention en sécurité routière, donc euh, de la Société de l'assurance automobile du Québec. Donc, euh, à la SAC, on a déployé une stratégie de prévention pour euh, les années 2021-2023. Et euh, je viens vous montrer aujourd'hui euh, brièvement quelques éléments qui nous ont permis euh, d'établir les priorités d'action, les, les thématiques et les clientèles sur lesquelles on devrait mettre vraiment plus d'efforts pour cette période-là 2021-2023. Donc, on a trois éléments aujourd'hui euh, à discuter. Euh, L'outil de priorisation des thématiques et des clientèles. Ensuite, on a fait un croisement entre les différentes thématiques et clientèles. Et euh, troisièmement, on a analysé les meilleures pratiques des administrations les plus performantes. Euh, donc, l'outil de priorisation des thématiques des clientèles, l'objectif de cet outil-là, c'était vraiment d'identifier les thématiques ou clientèles qui auraient un rôle primordial dans l'amélioration du bilan, du bilan routier québécois. Donc, le bilan routier euh, s'améliore depuis plusieurs années. Par contre, les gains sont de plus en plus difficiles au cours des dernières années. Donc, on voulait vraiment euh, s'assurer de travailler sur des thématiques ou des clientèles qui nous permettraient vraiment de venir euh, faire des gains en termes de décès et de victimes. Donc, on a fait une analyse selon deux axes. On a décidé de choisir les domaines d'action les plus importants. Donc, euh, ceux pour lesquels la proportion de victimes dans le bilan routier est la plus élevée. Et deuxièmement, choisir les domaines d'action qui offrent les meilleurs gains potentiels, donc en observant l'évolution au cours des dix dernières années. Euh, quand je parle de clientèle ou thématique, on a euh, pour notre analyse conservé une trentaine de clientèles et thématiques. Donc, les clientèles, c'est euh, notamment des victimes par groupe d'âge, ou euh, par catégorie d'usagers comme les piétons, les cyclistes, les véhicules lourds, etc. Et les thématiques, c'est plus euh, relié à des causes d'accident, donc euh, l'alcool, la drogue, euh, la vitesse, euh, la distraction au volant. Donc, on a conservé, comme je disais, une trentaine euh, de clientèles et thématiques pour notre analyse. Et l'idée de notre outil, c'était de mettre euh, ces différentes clientèles et thématiques-là dans un même graphique qu'on voit ici. Donc, on retrouve les euh, clientèles et thématiques de la, de la diapositive précédente. Euh, ils sont disposés selon nos deux axes, comme je disais plus tôt. Donc, l'axe horizontal qui vient nous euh, montrer la part dans le bilan routier de chacune des clientèles ou thématiques. Donc, par exemple, si on prend la distraction qui est vis-à-vis euh, -vis le 40%, donc ça, ça nous dit que 40% de nos victimes euh, ont été impliqués dans un accident où est-ce que la distraction était en cause. Donc, évidemment, toutes les thématiques ou clientèles qui se retrouvent à droite dans ce graphique-là devraient être priorisées parce qu'elles représentent une plus grande part de victimes. Euh, sur l'axe vertical, donc les thématiques et clientèles sont disposées selon l'évolution depuis les dix dernières années. Donc, si on regarde encore la distraction, euh, qui est à peu près à 9 ça veut dire que la proportion de victimes reliées à la distraction a augmenté de 9 au cours des dix dernières années. Donc, il y a une augmentation de la distraction dans notre bilan routier. Donc, évidemment, les euh, thématiques ou clientèles qui sont dans le haut du graphique devraient être priorisées parce qu'on a connu une détérioration. Donc, on pense qu'il va être plus facile de connaître une amélioration. Il y a certaines cli euh, clientèles ou thématiques, comme par exemple la vitesse, qui est dans le négatif, donc environ à moins 15 Donc, il y a eu une amélioration de la vitesse au cours des dix dernières années. La proportion de victimes reliées à la vitesse a diminué de 15 Donc, euh, nous, notre analyse nous a permis euh, d'identifier trois groupes euh, qu'on devait venir prioriser. Euh, donc, évidemment, ce groupe-là ici, la distraction et les comportements imprudents. Les comportements imprudents, c'est un petit euh, groupe de comportement, par exemple, euh, posséder le passage, euh, suivre de trop près, euh, pas faire un, un arrêt ou passer sur un feu rouge. Euh, donc, ces deux thématiques-là euh, représentent une grande proportion de victimes et euh, ont augmenté au cours des dix dernières années. Il y a ce deuxième groupe-là aussi qu'on veut euh, prioriser, 
pour la période 2021-2023. Donc, on a euh, les drogues, la fatigue, euh, les véhicules lourds, les piétons, les motocyclistes, les personnes aînées euh, en tant que victimes ou en tant que conducteurs. Donc, ce sont toutes des clientèles ou thématiques qui ont connu une augmentation au cours des dernières années. Et le dernier groupe qu'on a décidé de prioriser, c'est euh, le groupe ici, donc la vitesse et les jeunes conducteurs. Donc, c'est euh, deux thématiques qui sont en amélioration. Par contre, euh, c'est encore euh, des thématiques qui euh, représentent beaucoup de victimes, donc autour de 25-28 de nos victimes. Donc, si on prend euh, ces trois euh, groupes-là, on a 11 priorités qu'on veut, euh, sur lesquelles on veut travailler vraiment là, dans notre stratégie de prévention. Au fil euh, de, de nos travaux, on a décidé de conserver six thématiques prioritaires sur lesquelles travailler parce qu'on trouvait que 11, ça faisait beaucoup en trois ans. Donc, les six qu'on a conservés, c'est euh, celle en rouge, donc les comportements imprudents, la distraction, la vitesse, la fatigue, la drogue avec laquelle on est venu euh, associer l'alcool, qui est pas loin. Puis, on a ajouté une sixième qu'on a appelée partage de la route, qui vient inclure les motos, les piétons, les véhicules lourds, entre autres. Puis, dans chacune de nos thématiques, bien, on va venir s'adresser à des clientèles. Donc, par exemple, euh, quand on va être dans nos travaux pour la vitesse, on va venir s'adresser aux jeunes conducteurs parce qu'on sait qu'ils sont souvent impliqués dans les accidents à vitesse. Donc, nos 11 priorités du départ euh, vont être euh, adressées, mais on va, parler, euh, à des, on va parler à des thématiques. Puis, dans ces thématiques-là, euh, on va s'adresser à certaines clientèles. Euh, je vais partir vite sur cette diapo-là. Euh, C'était juste pour dire qu'on a pondéré les données dans le dans l'outil de priorisation, donc pour donner plus de poids aux décès, euh, parce qu'on sait qu'on n'a pas beaucoup de décès comparativement au nombre de blessés euh, légers. Donc, pour donner plus de poids aux décès, on a pondéré chaque victime selon euh, l'état des blessures. Euh, la deuxième... Euh, le deuxième élément dont on voulait parler, c'est le croisement entre les thématiques et les clientèles. Donc, euh, l'objectif de ce deuxième outil-là, c'était pour chaque priorité d'action, identifier quelles sont les clientèles à sensibiliser ou les autres thématiques à cibler. Donc, en fait, c'est une genre de matrice qu'on a construite dans laquelle on a, là je sais que c'est petit, mais je vais, la prochaine diapo va être plus grosse. Là. Donc, on a... Euh, à l'horizontale, en haut, toutes nos clientèles, nos thématiques qui ont ressorti comme étant prioritaires. Puis, on vient à la verticale remettre nos clientèles thématiques, les 30 là, qui étaient au départ dans l'analyse. Puis, ça vient nous, euh, en faisant le croisement, ça vient nous donner l'importance de chaque clientèle à travers, à travers chacune des thématiques. Donc, par exemple, si on prend la thématique vitesse ici, on vient voir euh, chaque clientèle, quelle est son importance dans la vitesse. Donc, si on regarde la clientèle des jeunes conducteurs, les conducteurs de 16-24 ans, on a ici un 26 vis-à-vis euh, -vis la vitesse. Donc, ça veut dire que euh, la proportion du jeune conducteur dans les accidents à vitesse est de 26 euh, Si je compare avec le total des accidents corporels, euh, le pourcentage de jeunes conducteurs est de 20 Donc, le pourcentage de conducteurs de 16-24 ans est plus important dans les accidents à vitesse, donc sont surreprésentés pour cette thématique-là. Et le code de couleur, là, de plus on, on est enfoncé, plus la surreprésentation d'une clientèle est importante dans une thématique. Donc, ça, cet outil-là vient nous dire, quand je vais être dans notre plan d'action vitesse, à qui je devrais adresser mes messages de sensibilisation vers qui je devrais diriger mes actions terrain. Donc, c'est sûr que quand on va être en vitesse, il va falloir parler aux jeunes conducteurs. Quand on va être, par exemple, en fatigue, on va s'adresser peut-être davantage aux conducteurs âgés qui sont surreprésentés dans les accidents fatigues. Et finalement, la, le dernier élément qu'on voulait présenter... Cynthia, two minutes. Oui, merci. Euh, c'est les meilleures pratiques des, euh, des administrations plus performantes que nous. Donc, on a regardé, évidemment, on a fait de l'étalonnage pour voir avec qui on devrait se comparer euh, pour nous inspirer euh, dans l'élaboration de nos différentes actions. Donc, 
ce qu'on a fait, c'est qu'on s'est comparé, nous, au Québec, avec dix euh, administrations plus performantes que nous euh, en 2016. Donc, quand on a fait nos travaux, les données qu'on avait, c'était 2016 pour l'ensemble des pays. Donc, on a comparé notre taux de décès par 100 000 habitants. Donc, nous, au Québec, en 2016, on avait un taux de 4,2 et euh, ces dix pays-là avaient un meilleur taux que nous. Donc, notamment la Suisse et la Norvège qui avaient un taux de 2,6. On a regardé aussi la variation. Donc, en 10 ans, euh, nous, au Québec, on est passé de 104 à 346 décès, donc une variation de 43 Et on a regardé les autres pays, de quelle façon ils ont, ils ont varié eux aussi. Euh, donc, ça nous donne une base de pays avec qui se comparer et de qui s'inspirer. On est allé un petit peu plus loin euh, au niveau de l'étalonnage. Euh, on on s'est comparé sur certaines catégories d'usagers. Par exemple, euh, si je regarde euh, au niveau des piétons, donc nous au Québec, euh, en 10 ans, on est passé de 88 à 62 décès chez nos piétons, donc une baisse de 29,5%. Et euh, pour la même période, il y a certains pays comme le Danemark qui ont connu une baisse de 47%. Même chose pour les motos cyclistes, nous on a connu une baisse de 14% au niveau des décès et certains pays ont réussi à obtenir une baisse de 48 Donc ça, ça vient nous indiquer encore plus pour une thématique ou une clientèle, euh, quel pays devrait nous inspirer, quel pays a implanté des mesures, euh, fait des campagnes euh, de sensibilisation qui ont vraiment permis d'atteindre des, des meilleurs résultats que nous. Donc ça, l'étalonnage, ça continue d'être dans nos travaux euh, pour toute la période de la stratégie de prévention. Et donc, c'est le tour pour euh, ce qu'on voulait vous présenter par rapport à notre stratégie. Merci beaucoup. And thank you, Cynthia, for the, for your presentation. Um, I don't see any questions that have. I don't see any questions that have come up through the Q and A. So I, I would like to sincerely thank you. Um, and I, I please everybody just stay on for two more minutes. Um, there was a uh, oh sorry a question did. Uh, come up here for uh, for for, um, uh, for Cynthia, uh, and that is, pensez-vous faire un classement des vies de QC? Um, pour l'instant, notre stratégie est vraiment globale pour le Québec. Là, on a on a par contre un outil de cartographie qui vient nous nous aider dans nos actions. Donc, on a cartographier tous les accidents euh, sur une carte du Québec. Donc, on peut voir euh, grâce à ça où, où sont les problèmes euh, dans certaines régions, certaines municipalités. Euh, donc, il y a ça comme outil de disponible. Great, thank you. And, and one uh, comment, and it's giving me a chance to press my French here. Bravo pour une présentation très intéressante. So thank you, uh, Cynthia. We're going to go back to the question that was asked of Catherine uh, earlier, just with the clarification. So um, near the end of uh, 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 Catherine's presentation, she mentioned that the implementation of road safety policy can be negatively affected by the bias of those enacting the policy. Um, the questioner was curious as to whether uh, uh, Catherine has any specific examples of how that, weaken, how that bias weakens the policy. Catherine, feel free to turn your video on. Oui. Alors, je ne peux pas allumer la, la caméra, mais euh, je, parce que je n'ai pas la main dessus. No mais euh, je peux répondre. Euh, ah, ça y est. Voilà. Oui, donc, euh, pour expliquer euh, par rapport aux biais euh, que nous avons euh, observés, euh, alors, pour expliquer, c'est que la, la Gendarmerie nationale, euh, on l'a comparé euh, son, son recensement des accidents par rapport à celui de la sécurité publique, qu'on appelle aussi la, la police nationale. Et il se trouve que les accidents que recense la Gendarmerie nationale, euh, les accidents, euh, en fait, ce sont les accidents qui impliquent des blessés légers, sont sous-recensés. C'est pour ça que le taux de gravité est anormalement élevé par rapport à celui euh, de la police. Donc, ce, ce cas, en fait, se présente dans des communes euh, plutôt de première couronne 
parce que c'est dans ces communes de première couronne qu'intervient principalement euh, la gendarmerie nationale, alors que les forces de police euh, municipales sont plus, elles, dans les villes-centres. Donc, d'où le, le problème qui s'est posé à nous euh, de ne pas pouvoir euh, évaluer euh, ces premières couronnes, parce que potentiellement, nous n'avions pas tous les accidents recensés euh, dans ces territoires-là. J'espère euh, avoir répondu à la question. Thank you, Catherine. I'm just going to ask all of uh, the speakers to put their videos on just so we can thank you one last time. Uh, we don't have any more time for questions. We have passed the, um, uh, the end time for the session. But uh, while you're turning your video on, I just want to read a comment that came in earlier. And that is that the idea that collisions and fatalities are an inevitability may lead to public complacency. And then the second point is, from personal experience, the merging of safe system or vision zero can be polarizing in and of itself. So I just wanted to share that with the audience. I think it's appropriate. And um, lastly, uh, thank you all. I, we can virtually applaud for you for your presentations. And I just have a, a last uh, announcement, which is that the CARSP annual general meeting uh, is uh, it's probably already started. So uh, you, you want to head over to the, uh, the website and, and participate in that. And as a member of the board, I can tell you sincerely that one of our, the main parts of our strategic plan is to respond to the needs of the membership. So if you have any suggestions for the organization, whether it relates to the conference or anything else, please do join the meeting, learn more about what's going on, but also share your thoughts with us. And with that, um, thank you again to the speakers and thank you for everybody who joined and please enjoy the rest of the conference. Goodbye. Au revoir.